last talk of the afternoon in the conference uh, will be by Cheryl Sisk from Michigan State University on the topic of neuroendocrine mechanisms underlying adolescent maturation of social reward and proficiency. Okay, well, um, thank you very much. I'd like to um, thank especially uh, Tomas Paus and the program committee for the opportunity to present uh, at this meeting. I, it's my first time at the meeting, and it's been really great. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to, to be able to come. And so, um, one of the things that um, my lab has been interested in over the um, years is the influence of gonadal steroid hormones on uh, the development of the adolescent brain. And we've been particularly interested in this topic and how the hormones shape brain development with outcomes for behavior during this time. Um, because, as everyone knows, um, the period of adolescent development is, the, is, is a window of time during which uh, sex differences in um, susceptibility to psychopathologies emerge. So we've been interested in the role of hormones uh, during this developmental process. And I'd like to start with um, just a, a reminder of how um, hormonal programming of sex-typical adult social behaviors is typically viewed. So uh, this uh, schematic shows levels of gonadal hormones uh, throughout uh, postnatal development. And the um, classic idea is that in males, where there is a perinatal elevation in uh, testosterone levels, this um, exposure to the developing brain um, to uh, testosterone during this time masculinizes and defeminizes neural circuits so that when um, uh, the gonadal hormones become elevated once again at the time of puberty, the hormones can activate or facilitate the expression of sex-typical um, uh, social behaviors uh, at that time. And in the absence of this uh, perinatal rise in testosterone, which would be the case, um, thank you. I'm not pushing that button that everyone else is pushing. <laughs> Huh? All right. Oh, I see. There's enough. Okay, got it. I was pushing that button. That was <laughs> okay, where was I? Oh, okay. Um, in the absence of um, a, pu a perinatal uh, uh, elevation in testosterone, which would be the case in the nor normally developing female, there is no such masculinizing effect. I did not do it that way. <laughs> Um, then you would have uh, development along uh, uh, typically female lines and uh, then uh, with the expression of female uh, uh, sex typical behaviors in response to uh, pubertal elevation and ovarian hormones at that time. So um, the way to think about this then is that these organizational effects are, uh, of uh, steroid hormones are an example of endogenous early life programming that then sets up the nervous system to respond in a particular way to hormones later on in adulthood. Now, in the past uh, 15 or so years, um, research from my lab and others has um, determined that in addition to um, this perinatal uh, period of organization, there is a second wave of organization by uh, gonadal steroid hormones that occurs at um, the onset of puberty when, again, um, gonadal hormones become elevated. So we think of this as a second stage of early life programming. And uh, in the case of males, again, uh, testosterone is, is now um, further masculinizing and uh, shaping and organizing the male brain. It had already been masculinized um, back here. So we think of this second period of organization as um, a fine tuning or um, a, a sort of a finishing school for um, brain development during this time. And also, uh, we now know that in females, uh, ovarian hormones are participating in this pubertal wave of organization, um, which is uh, different because uh, ovarian hormones are not participating in this perinatal period of organization. So today I'm going to then focus on uh, some experiments where we've attempted to determine which aspects of male social behavior are organized 
um, during this uh, peripubertal <coughs> wave of organization versus which aspects of male social behavior are purely activated by testosterone during this time. So the focus on it, today's talk is going to be on the male uh, situation. Now, why would we care about which aspects of social behavior are organized versus which ones are um, activated at the time of puberty? Well, um, the reason is because um, the sensitivity of the brain to organizational effects of testosterone um, uh, changes over the course of um, uh, pubertal or postnatal development. And this is a schematic slide based on some work that was done by Kaylin Schultz uh, when she was a graduate student in the lab. And to make a long story short, um, what Kaylin found was that um, uh, brain sensitivity to the organizing effects of testosterone um, is um, the a decrease in fun a decreasing function across postnatal um, life, such that by the end of um, adolescence, which in uh, rodents, which what we study is about eight weeks of age, the ad adult brain is relatively insensitive to organizational effects of testosterone. So, okay, what does that mean? Well. Um, we can think about um, early bloomers versus late bloomers and uh, then look at this uh, point in development when the development of the adolescent brain, which is a moving target uh, with respect to uh, steroid hormone action, um, we, we can think about the, um, the situation where um, in an early bloomer, um, the adolescent brain would be intercepted by uh, steroid hormones at a time when it was more sensitive to those organizing effects than would be the case in the late bloomer. And if we also think about not just in terms of decreasing sensitivity of these organizational effects, but also the fact that um, what the brain is doing during this time, uh, for example, is it at a period of uh, synaptic um, uh, expansion or is it a, at a period of, of synaptic elimination that the effects of these uh, gonadal hormones are going to be very different depending on uh, the, the timing of this intersection. So understanding um, what is what aspects of social behavior are organized by testosterone uh, during this time male, male will help us understand how normal variation in the timing of puberty determines behavioral phenotypes in uh, adulthood, behavioral phenotypes in terms of how they respond to hormones. And it also can uh, help inform us about the consequences. Oops. About the consequences of more extreme cases of pubertal timing, either uh, delayed puberty, which is um, uh, more common in um, uh, boys than in girls, whereas precocious puberty is more common in girls, but also in um, situations like um, the postponement of puberty onset um, uh, pharmacologically in, say, children with gender dysphoria. So these are um, kids who would not normally be experiencing the, um, uh, the, the pubertal rise in testosterone, and it's, um, I think, important for us to know what outcomes that might have. Um, on their later behavior. So that's what we've been um, studying and why. Let me just um, explain a little bit of the experimental strategy for how we go about asking this question, which aspects of uh, social behavior are activated versus which are organized. This work that I'm telling you today has all been done using a male Syrian hamster as an animal model. Um, we've chosen this animal as, as a model system for uh, various reasons that um, uh, I can go into if, if you're interested, but one of the things that makes uh, this animal particularly useful for the kinds of studies I'm going to be talking about today is that the adult male hamster is utterly dependent upon um, neural processing of female pheromones in, for the expression of male sexual behavior. Um, without the olfactory bulbs, for example, or without being able to neurally process these pheromones, even in the presence of uh, buckets of testosterone, this male will not uh, mate with a receptive female. So it's, it, the sexual behavior in this species requires the neural integration of a chemosensory social stimulus along with uh, internal hormone uh, signaling for the behavior to occur. Okay, so if we're interested in what um, behaviors are activated, um, we um, first of all look at or confirm that um, if in adulthood, if we do a typical hormone uh, removal replacement study, 
Um, we show that uh, we can activate the behavior in the adult by uh, replacing testosterone. So this would be a gonadectomized adult given back testosterone and we observe some behavior as a result of that hormone replacement. If we now um, treat a juvenile uh, male hamster, uh, gonadectomize them and then give them testosterone so that uh, we can experimentally control the levels of testosterone to be equal in these two groups, if we are able to um, uh, see the same level of behavioral activation in the juvenile as in the adult, then we know that all of the um, organization, all of the hormonal programming that was required yeah, for this particular behavior was set up by this perinatal wave of organization, the brain's good to go, nothing else is needed uh, during this uh, pubertal time. So, um, this uh, pattern of results tells us that a particular uh, aspect or a particular behavior is activated by pubertal testosterone. And the way we um, ask about organizational effects is that we create uh, a group of hamsters that are gonadectomized prior to the um, pubertal onset of testosterone secretion. And so then they spend their entire adolescent development in the absence of uh, any testosterone. We then replace testosterone in adulthood, observe their behavior, and um, then ask how that behavior is activated um, when there's been no testosterone during development. We compare that to um, the behavior of animals that were uh, gonadectomized um, in adulthood. So they did experience this endogenous rise in uh, hormone. And um, so any difference between these two groups tells us, uh, in the behavior of these two groups, tells us something about the presence or absence of testosterone. And um, our shorthand for these groups are no T at P and um, T at P. So you'll be seeing that in graphs a little bit later on. And again, if we find differences between these two groups of uh, animals, we infer that um, uh, there are organizational effects of testosterone that have to occur in order for these um, behaviors um, to be expressed uh, appropriately in adulthood. Okay, um, I must be not talking fast enough because I'm <laughs> Uh, getting short on time here, but uh, I just wanted to provide a theoretical framework for um, the experiments that um, I'm going to be discussing, and I wanted to point out that two put papers, one by Dodge uh, and then one by uh, Nelson, have really influenced uh, our thinking about um, the development of social cognition uh, during adolescence. And um, from Dodge's uh, work, we have a framework for social cognition or social information processing, where one of the first things that uh, happens in a social interaction is that um, social cues or social stimuli have to be perceived and interpreted. Uh, then the animal evaluates the repertoire of responses that it has available to it, and then eventually selects one of those and enacts a behavior that is um, in response to the perception of those social cues. Now, um, social experiences are generally not uh, just uh, single events, but they recur. And so then there's a process of uh, social learning in which um, as a function of social experience, an animal can learn to make behavioral adaptations uh, uh, depending on the, um, uh, the other conspecific's response to their um, behavioral enactment, and then this in turn can lead to social proficiency or social skill. Now on top of this whole um, um, social information processing uh, framework, we have an idea of social reorientation which uh, was um, elaborated on by Nelson and colleagues, and that is the idea that during adolescence, um, as the focus of prim primary focus of social interaction switches from um, uh, family to peers, you have this whole change in um, social reward, uh, the salience of social stimuli, and the incentive um, um, incentive salience of social stimuli. And so this whole process of social information processing has to undergo a, a transformation as the um, uh, animal goes through adolescent development. And today I'm going to be um, talking about uh, two ends of this whole process, that is the perception of social cues and then this idea of behavioral adaptation and uh, social proficiency. Yeah, boy. 
do that. Okay. Okay, oh no, now we're, I think I'm in that state where the... Okay, so the first experiment that I'm going to show um, will uh, demonstrate that in terms of social reward or the adolescent reorientation of incentive motivation of social stimuli is an activated um, effect of testosterone. And so to uh, do this, we have used a condition place preference paradigm. In the interest of time, I won't um, go through this. Many of you are, perhaps all of you are familiar with this, but the idea here is that you have a conditioning chamber where the two, two sides are very different in terms of texture and smell and, and um, uh, other features. And then um, the animal is positioned um, in one of these two chambers over a series of conditioning sessions in which one of the um, chambers is paired with a stimulus, in this case, uh, it's uh, vaginal secretions from a receptive female. Um, on conditioning days or reinforced days, and these are alternated with non-conditioning days in which the animal is uh, just given the vehicle, then we can calculate a preference score, that is, um, which of these chambers did the animal prefer to be in during a pretest time before conditioning and then after conditioning and ask whether the animal's um, preference has switched as a result of this conditioning, and, that, and if it has, then that tells us that this um, the stimulus uh, is rewarding. So uh, this simply shows you that um, in sexually, sexually naive adult males, we can condition a place preference for vaginal secretions. Um, so uh, no, no change in um, preference score when vehicle is used, um, and here's a change in, um, place in, in preference score uh, when uh, vaginal secretions containing those female pheromones are used for conditioning. So um, these are sexually naive adult males, so this chemosensory stimulus is an unconditioned stimulus for reward, even in the absence of sexual experience. We find that um, uh, juveniles do not form a condition place preference to uh, vaginal secretions. Um, so here's a condition place preference of adults not in juveniles, even though they do form a condition place preference to cocaine. And then in a series of uh, studies in which we were uh, using um, the immediate early gene uh, FOS as a marker of uh, neuronal activation, we found that uh, just simply uh, experiencing this um, uh, chemosensory stimulus, uh, female pheromones, um, elicited a FOS response uh, that was specific to adults, so not in, in juveniles, in areas of the um, reward system, infralimbic cortex, a nucleus of Cummins core, and uh, certain areas of the ventral tegmental area. Um, so I will uh, uh, go through this briefly. This graph simply shows that um, the ability to uh, form a form a condition place preference in adults is activated by testosterone. It's not formed in adults that don't have testosterone, it's formed in adults that do. And similarly, we can activate um, a, a place preference to female pheromones in juveniles simply by treating them with testosterone. So the amazing thing here to me is that uh, testosterone is capable of transforming female uh, pheromones into a rewarding unconditioned stimulus. Just that alone is sufficient to make this a rewarding stimulus to a juvenile male that otherwise doesn't care. 
I'll skip over this in the interest of time, uh, just to say that we know that the ability to um, uh, form this condition place preference um, that is dependent on testosterone is mediated by uh, dopamine uh, D2 receptor activation. So now let's go to this idea of social proficiency. Um, and the bottom line here is that behavioral ad adaptability to social experience is programmed or organized by uh, testosterone during puberty. So um, just, just a reminder of what we're going to be looking at here, these two different groups, TFP and no TFP. So let me explain uh, for a minute that what, what this uh, measure is here. Uh, we're looking at the number of ectopic mounts that are displayed by uh, gonad intact males over the course of four um, uh, tests with a sexually receptive female. So normally, um, uh, with sexually naive uh, animals, when they're first put in their uh, first encounter with a sexually receptive female, there's an investigation and then a proceeding to mounts, intermissions, and ejaculations. In sexually naive um, individuals, which would be the case here on this first test, um, the males are kind of uncoordinated, they don't really have their act together, and so they will um, show these ectopic mounts, which are like mounting against the head, against the side, they, you know, they're the wrong end of the body. But you can see that normally, um, over a course of four sexual um, tests, those number of ectopic mounts decreases. So they're getting their act together. If we look at the same behavior in these TFP animals, so again, these are animals that did have uh, testosterone during puberty and adolescence, um, would have been exposed or would have uh, had uh, organizing effects if they were there. Um, we see the uh, same pattern, so a, a high number of ectopic mounts here in the first couple of um, uh, sexual tests dropping down to low levels um, in subsequent tests. Finally, the no TFP males, man, they just don't get it. So they um, uh, continue to show ectopic mounts, even with sexual experience. And um, so they just, um, <laughs> yeah. Now, this is not just a one-off with um, uh, these animals being sexually incompetent. We have other measures of uh, social proficiency in male-male interactions, where normally they establish uh, a dominant subordinate relationship fairly quickly and then maintain that with scent marking, um, these no TFP males um, are completely messed up uh, in that respect as well. So there's something about their ability to um, change their behaviors as a result of social experience that doesn't seem to be um, all quite there uh, if they have not experienced testosterone during puberty. Um, we're turning now, in terms of possible mechanisms, to looking at delta Fox B, uh, which, um, again, uh, we know about initially from studies uh, from the drug literature. It seems to um, be mediating long-term adaptations to rewarding stimuli, and uh, it is um, one of the immediate early genes, or a variant of the immediate early genes, that uh, turns out to be um, stable. Uh, and builds up with experience. Um, this is just showing you that, uh, from a study from Lipa Kulin's lab, that uh, delta Fox B uh, expression is stably induced with sexual experience, both in areas of the prelimbic cortex and in the accumbens. And then this data from my lab, Kayla DeGorm's part of her dissertation, uh, was to show that um, in uh, that, sorry, that delta Fox B is expressed in the infralimbic cortex after sexual experience, but only in no TFP, I'm sorry, only in TFP males. So these no TFP males seem not to show this, um, this neural response, this buildup of delta Fox B expression in, uh, in infralimbic cortex, as do the, the no TFP, uh, sorry, the TFP males. Perhaps you could give us your conclusions. Okay. Um, so then, uh, the, the last uh, data slide then is to show that if we overexpress delta Fox B in the infralimbic cortex of no TFP males, uh, we basically turn them into animals that think they've had experience. So um, with, uh, here's the decline in uh, ectopic mounts. Um, with TFP males, the no TFP males showing uh, with, with just the GFP reporter, um, not showing a decrease in ectopic mounts. And here are the animals that have overexpressed delta Fox B in infralimbic cortex. Not only do they, uh, well, they show very low levels of ectopic mounts, even in that first test. 
Um, so, um, here are some questions for future study, which um, we can uh, talk about. I, I'm very interested to know what this um, social proficiency um, really is about what, in terms of the underlying psychological con uh, constructs and then the mechanisms by which uh, Delta Phosphate um, is promoting behavioral adaptability. Um, so again, showed you that uh, perception of social cues and the rewarding, um, the uh, social reward is activated by testosterone at puberty, which uh, sort of makes sense evolutionarily. You don't kind of want that to um, be uh, subject to happenstance of when puberty actually occurs, whereas these um, the ability of uh, behavioral adaptability and social proficiency uh, seems to be uh, programmed um, by testosterone during this period of time. So I'd just like to thank the um, uh, current and former members of my lab who have, in one way or another, all contributed to this line of research, and I've uh, particularly highlighted the work of those shown in green here. So thank you. Sorry I ran over time. And <laughs>